Oh, what, a, what a great time. I'm glad to be here this morning with you. Paisley, shout out. Happy times. Uh, wow, I've been thinking about you, Paisley. I've got some schemes in my head. So uh, good things, good things coming. Um, let me start by blessing us all, and let's, let's dive in this morning. I bless you now in the name of Jesus that you would know Jesus more wonderfully this morning. I bless you to receive healing if you need healing in your body, in your mind, in your emotions, in your spirit today. I bless you to receive whatever guidance from God you need, whatever help from God you need immediately. I bless you to have the courage and capacity to flourish and prevail over every challenge. And I bless you to feel hope and joy and love and peace and freedom, whatever is going on. I bless you with that in the name of Jesus. May it be. Amen. Okay, so we are in a study on the book of, in the book of Mark here. It's about Jesus. And we saw in verse 1 that this book is, is talking about the good news, the euangelion, the gospel of Jesus, King Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, and, and how we're, we're being announced of a, a, a new kingdom. A couple weeks ago, we talked about the kingdom of God. And so we're, we're talking about this, this new king, this new kingdom era. And then we saw how Jesus calls disciples to follow him. And he's training them how to fish for people. Remember, the kingdom of God is supposed to grow, Daniel chapter 2. It's supposed to grow until it fills the whole earth. And so we, we've seen several bits and, and angles about how God, Jesus is developing his disciples so that they grow the kingdom, whether it's external ministry plans or, or internal life ministry priorities. Today's lesson is in the same vein as Jesus continues to show his people how, how to grow the kingdom. Uh, today we're, we're going to look at a series of events starting in Mark chapter 4, and I'm just going to read through them, make a few comments along the way, setting up a story. It's going to take us a while to get to the point that I'm trying to get to. And, and you're going to be feeling like, oh, stop there and just keep talking about that. Well, I'm sorry. We, we, got, we got some places to go. But I'm going to start reading today in Mark chapter 4, starting in verse 35. And, and here's, what we, here's what we read. As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they took Jesus in the boat and started out, leaving the crowds behind, although other boats followed. Now, just as a reminder, Jesus has been teaching about the kingdom of God. That's what he's been doing all day. We talked about the kingdom of God a couple weeks ago. Now Jesus is saying to his disciples, let's get in the boat right now at the end of this big day and go to the other side of the lake. Why? It doesn't say. Why now? Like, why tonight? Why not wait till the morning? It's been a big day. It, it doesn't say. Jesus just says, we're going to cross over to the other side, and the disciples say, yes. They, they, they say yes, and, and they do it. They cross. They don't know why. doesn't matter to them. Jesus says, we're crossing. They're crossing with him. Was it easy and safe? Eh. Verse 37, but soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. Okay, so Jesus said, let's cross, and the disciples say yes, and then there's a fierce storm, which was so bad that they all should have died. Make sure that you stick that in your theology. All right, Jesus said, let's do this. They say yes, and the situation was so dangerous, they, they should have died. It took one of the most extreme miracles in the New Testament to save their lives. Uh, but then we, we keep reading. Verse 38, Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion, you know. The disciples woke him up shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? Now, what a line. Don't you care. Don't you care that we're going to drown? When we say yes to, to following Jesus, I mean, just because it might look awful and, and impossible and like, like certain doom, Jesus, well, he's not worried, first of all. Fact, he cares. Jesus cares. Fact. And fact, he's not worried. 
He cares, and he's not worried about impossible situations. He's not worried about their impossible situation. He's not worried about your impossible situation. He cares. If you've said yes to Jesus, and if you are following Jesus, and if you have reached beyond your limits, beyond what you can do, beyond your survival capability, I suppose in this case, Jesus cares. But he isn't worried because all he has to do is speak. He's not worried because all he has to do about your situation or any situation is speak. Your your situation then of certain doom becomes a miracle story. An amazing story. And that's what happens here. Uh, Continuing to read verse 39. When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, silence, be still. Ah, he probably did a little. Silence, be still. Suddenly the wind stopped and there was great, a great calm. Then he asked them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? The disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man? They asked each other. Even the wind and waves obeyed him. I also dropped on Psalm 107, which which I I flagged up in my Bible read-through the last week. I don't know if you noticed it. I knew I was going to be talking about this passage. But but what a a passage uh, that the disciples probably weren't holding on to in that moment. Psalm 107, Lord, help, they cried in their trouble. And he saved them from their distress. He calmed the storm to a whisper and stilled the waves. It just reminded me so much of what they're going through here. Also Jonah and that story. But back, back to Mark. Back to Mark here. These disciples, they said yes. And sure, it looks impossible, and and their situation looks hopeless, and there's nothing humanly speaking that they can do about it, and they're terrified, and Jesus says, why are you afraid? Well, the boat's kind of filling up with water, and we're all going to drown. It's not just our boat. All the boats here, we're in a big storm. And it's not just a scary storm. We're going down. Why? All right. Why do you still have no faith? Just because you're in an impossible situation <laughs> that looks like certain doom. Jesus is like, why, why are you so afraid? Well, just a reminder, I talked about this several, several weeks ago. Uh, when Jesus calls you, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Never worry that Jesus doesn't care about you or your situation, that he's not paying attention. Faith means trusting that when you said yes to God and when you said yes to following God and taking the risk, it's going to be worth it no matter the success or failure. No matter, matter you know, living or dying, when we say yes and trusting God, God's going to get us to the ending that he has called us to, to. Knowing he cares, knowing he can be trusted. So Jesus says, cross the sea. The disciples say yes, becomes this impossible, and yet all they need to do here is trust Jesus to take care of the impossible. That's, that's simple, right? Simple. All they need to do is trust Jesus to take care of the impossible on the thing that he's called them to do. Now, this is good stuff, but but we're we're still not there yet. We're still not where we want to get. So we turn the page, we get to chapter 5, and we keep reading about this same same trip. So they they arrived, verse verse 1 of chapter 5, at the other side of the lake in the region of the Gerasenes, when Jesus climbed out of the boat, a man possessed by an evil spirit came out from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the burial caves and could no longer be restrained, even with a chain. Whenever he was put into chains and shackles, as he often was, he snapped the chains from his wrists and smashed the shackles. No one was strong enough to subdue him. 
Day and night, he wandered among the burial caves in the hills, howling and cutting himself with sharp stones. I got some pictures uh, just just for fun, we'll take a break here. So the, the boat trip path, we're starting up at the top. We're going to the bottom of the lake, across the lake the long way, right? Not just across the lake. They're taking the boat trip. Uh, picture c- circa 1910, storm Galilee, big, big waves. That's not a boat, that's a building, but you, you get the vibes. Uh, the bottom right, burial ca- caves in the area, not the exact ones in this area, but Roman era, bur- this, this, these years vintage uh, burial caves, it, just north of this site, but in the area. Um, the, the location, the picture in the bottom there, you've got the harbor where Jesus pulls up. You've got the, the um, Tel Samra, that, which is where the burial caves are, and then you've got... Um, Percy Pig Hill in the background, see the, the slope in the background where, where, the, 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 where the pigs are. That's, that's the vibe, that's the context of this story. Uh, continue on, verse 6, when, when Jesus was still some distance away, the man saw him, ran to meet him, and bowed low before him with a shriek. He screamed, why are you interfering with me, Jesus? Son of the Most High God, in the name of God, I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had already said many times. For Jesus had already said to the Spirit, come out of the man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus demanded, what is your name? And he replied, my name is Legion, because there are many of us inside of this man. Then the evil spirits begged him again and again not to send them to some distant place. There happened to be, yeah, continue to read, there happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding on the hillside nearby. Send us into those pigs, the spirits begged. Let us enter them. So Jesus gave them permission. The evil spirits came out of the man, entered the pigs, and the entire herd of about 2,000 pigs plunged down the steep hillside into the lake and drowned in the water. Okay, besides the fact that Legion has got to be one of the scariest names in, in, in the Bible, one of the top ten at least, many, many, many thousands, Legion would be 6,000, but, you know, l- roughly thousands of demons inside of me, at least 2,000. I just want to say as a side note to this passage, uh, this is one of the more helpful stories in the Bible when it comes to deliverance ministry because you have a highly, highly demonized person. Jesus commands the demons to go out repeatedly and they do not come out at first. Then Jesus asks the name of the demons and then he negotiates an exit plan including pigs nearby. There's lots of significant stuff. We're not going to talk about it today. You're like, whoa, Ingraham's not going to talk about this when he has the opportunity? What's happening here? Okay, uh, all I want to say today is you cannot find a more messed up person than this guy. That, that's the context I want you to see. When it comes to this person, you cannot find a more messed up person. He is the opposite of a godly man. He is the opposite of this worthy person, naturally speaking. I mean, he's the opposite of sane. He, he's... He, he's I guess you'd say his mental health is like 6,000 demons below zero, right? He, he's not okay. His mind is a wreck. His lifestyle is unhinged. He's literally insane. And then what happens to this, this guy? Well, verse 14. The herdsmen fled to a nearby town and the surrounding countryside, spreading the news as they ran, people rushed out to see what had happened, a crowd soon gathered around Jesus, and they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons. He was sitting there fully clothed and perfectly sane, and they were all happy, afraid. Then those who had seen what, had, what happened told the others about the demon-possessed man and the pigs, And the crowd began pleading with Jesus to go away and leave them alone. Okay, so you have the man, he's instantly changed, perfectly sane, and in their fear of what happened, they sent Jesus away. Now, 
by the way, want to make bad decisions following Jesus? Follow your fear. That, that, that's this super tip of how not to follow Jesus. Follow your fear. And, and, and here you have this, this fear of what happened with these demons. And, and, and oh man, that's scary, Jesus. We don't want that. Or what, we want just normal stuff. You know, go away. Or maybe they're afraid. Who knows why all the reasons they're afraid. Are they afraid what Jesus will tell them now? Or how he'll, they'll, they'll rebuke it, them? Or how they'll, um, they'll ask them to change or to give up some things in their lives? Maybe they're afraid because of how messed up their lives are. The right response to Jesus is always say, yes, Jesus, here I am. The wrong response to Jesus is always to say, no, go away. Leave me alone. It's always going to be rooted in some sort of fear. That re- the no response is always rooted in some sort of fear. As I've said before, fear is very dangerous when it comes to following Jesus. Anyway, so they send Jesus away, but what about the guy who had been demonized? Verse 18, as Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him, but Jesus said, no. Go home to your family and tell them everything the Lord has done for you. And how merciful he has been. So the man started off to visit the ten towns, called the Decapolis, of that region. And began to proclaim the great things Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed at what he told them. Okay, three things that just leap out to me at this passage. Number one. Jesus crossed the lake for one person only. Jesus crossed the lake for one person only. We're just retracing the story. Jesus gets in a boat, went across the sea during a storm that would have killed them all had not one of the biggest miracles in the New Testament taken place. And he goes and he he takes all the disciples and the the flotilla, all the boats with them. And not only does he cross at this most dangerous moment requiring a miracle to make it, he does it for only one person and then he gets in the boat and he goes back across. Jesus goes across the lake for one demon saturated. You can tell this guy's not praying to God for help here. He goes across the lake for one mentally shattered, life broken hopeless, insane person, and then he goes back across the lake again. And I just say, wow, if Jesus will sail across a stormy sea with all these boats, all these people requiring a super miracle to to even survive it, how much more will he do for you? How much more will he do for you as broken as you might be Whatever your story, whatever your situation, this guy here, this guy was worse. This guy was worse. And, and you, maybe, maybe you know Jesus, maybe you don't know Jesus, maybe you, maybe you don't even care about Jesus, but Jesus knows you. And he runs after this, this demon guy where he has his, he sails across the lake in a storm after this, this demon guy, and he, he does that when the, when the demonized guy doesn't know Jesus, Jesus is going after him, no matter how broken, no matter how angry, no matter how mentally ill your background, Jesus still values and cares about you, and he's able to bring peace to your heart and health and and find you in your right mind. Jesus Jesus loves you, and and he cares about you. I mean, a few weeks ago, I was preaching, and I heard my own preaching, and it, and it broke. The, just remind of, like, I did the unforgivable sin in the Bible. That just continues to stick with me. And, and if Jesus can forgive me, how much more anyone? Yeah. Anyways, he goes across the lake for one person. I love that. Number the second thing I love is Jesus said no to how the man wanted to follow Jesus. You know, he wanted to follow Jesus one way, the normal way, actually, the intelligent way, the, the sane way. He wanted to follow Jesus the same way. I'm going to follow you around, Jesus, and learn from you. 
I want to hear your teachings. I want to learn first, and, and when I'm ready, I'll go up. And Jesus said to this, no. Jesus has a different plan for the guy, but I don't want to miss the fact that sometimes we want to follow Jesus one way. We want to follow Jesus maybe the most appropriate way, the most right way, the most logical way, the most sensible way, and sometimes Jesus says no to that. Do you know, it wasn't until I started my seventh year of ministry training, I I went through four years of, of Bible college and theology training, and then I did three years of seminary. For six years, I said, Jesus, I will follow you. I will do whatever you want. I will be a missionary. I will live in a grass hut. I will be a Bible translator. I will go to Erie and Jaya. I will go to anywhere in the world. I will do what, I will be a teens pastor even. I will be a, I will be a college brother. I will be an executive, second in charge of a church, like an administrative pastor in a church. Just not a senior pastor. Just not the preacher. Please, I will do anything but be a senior pastor or a preacher for six years. And then finally in that seventh year, I was just like, Lord, I will say yes, but I don't think this is a good idea. I I just, I don't want that. I don't think I'll be very good at that. Anything else but that. Now, Back to our story here, Jesus says, go, and he says, tell, and and, and to that, this guy who used to be demonized says, yes, and he goes out right away. Now, would you look at this story and think, this guy is ready I mean, would, would, would you say, uh, yeah, this guy's, this guy's ready. He's ready to be a missionary. He's ready to be a missionary. He's re- ready to set out. He's just minutes ago, maybe 60 minutes ago, set free from thousands of demons. But that's, that's point number three. Jesus sent someone we would consider not ready. Jesus sent someone we would consider not ready. This guy was not ready. If there was ever a definition that we would consider not ready, this guy. Zero training. He hasn't heard a single teaching from Jesus yet in his life. He isn't ready, but Jesus sees something in this guy, and and that's all that he really is. He's not trained and and not ready, and yet he's willing to say yes and to keep saying yes. Jesus is going to tell, I don't, he's going to say, Jesus sent me, so I don't, I don't know anything, but I'm just going to go, and I'm going to say yes. I'm just going to say yes. And friends, honestly, we're never ready. Get past the delusion of readiness. But we need to always be saying yes. We need to always be saying yes to Jesus. Readiness isn't important to Jesus. Your readiness isn't important. Saying yes and being someone who will keep saying yes to Jesus, no matter the storm, no matter how bad it gets, no matter how impossible it seems, even if it's a different version of following Jesus than you think is a a good idea, Jesus is looking for people who will hear the call of Jesus and say, yes, ready or not, here I come. That's what Jesus is looking for. And and if there's one thing that we see over and over in the Bible, Jesus builds people on the way. He builds people on the way as we follow. As we follow, as we're going. We never seem to be ready, but when we say yes, Jesus is like, okay, I will train you on the way. I will guide you on the way as you keep following Jesus. I kind of wonder... If many people don't hear much from Jesus this day, these days because Jesus gives most of his directions to his followers. His followers. Those following him, not those waiting to follow until they hear more. Look at the end of Luke chapter 9 for some examples of, of those types of people. But, but anyways, this is what I see in the disciples. I see in the disciples that God uses uh, 
people like, like this demonized guy in, the, in this story, or God uses people in our generation in surprising ways, and he seems to be looking for three main things. One of them is not readiness. He's looking for people who hear and follow and quickly say yes to Jesus. Readiness doesn't matter as much. He's looking for people who are teachable and avid learners, still in a learning posture, not in a I, I know what to do posture. People who with a never give, give up attitude unless Jesus himself redirects. All Jesus needs is a person who will say yes and who will keep saying yes no matter what because Jesus can do the rest if you keep saying yes and do not give up. When it comes to the story of this church uh, and my story, I said, I said yes. Uh, Jesus asked me to plant a church in Scotland, right? I said yes. I quit my job. Um, which affected both me and my wife and my kids, uh, moved to Scotland. I tried to start a church. I couldn't do it. I failed. I tried to start another church. I couldn't do it. I failed. I proved that I did not have what it takes in myself to start a church in Scotland. I took a huge risk. I stepped out. Two years of experience as a missionary in Scotland proved that I could not do it. And my experience was failure after failure for a couple of years. And all I had was my yes to Jesus, a determination to keep saying yes to Jesus. And I had some prayer times with Jesus where I kept letting him know, I'm not going to give up. Even when I fail and even as I keep proving that I can't do this, I will keep trying again until I hear something else from you. It's pretty simple following Jesus, at least for me in, in those years, all I had to do was not let my inability and my track record of failure get in the way of saying yes. All I had to do was not let my, my proven inability and my track record of failure get in the way of continuing to say yes. I mean, you think of reasons why, uh, why people say no to Jesus well, maybe they're not 100% sure that Jesus has spoken to them. I mean, I wasn't 100% sure when I moved here. The, the idea is that we're not ready. We, we don't have the right training or the skill set. We're, we're not ready because we still have sin issues. Dude, that demon guy, the demonized guy, like, he didn't even have a 24-hour, like, free from thousands of demons uh, track record yet before Jesus sends, sends him out. I mean, yes, okay, sin's a big deal. And, and, and as Jesus calls you, deal with it and, and, and reject it and, and walk in godliness and, and holiness. Uh, but some people are like, I'm not going to follow Jesus until these things get out of my life. Sometimes Jesus deals with them, wants you to deal with them on the way. He says, go, and so you go and you deal with it on the way. One of the reasons we say no is other reasons could be fear, doubt, worry, desire for comfort, risk aversion. But my friends, all I'm really saying is following Jesus is simple. You just say yes. You say yes, and you, you keep saying yes, and you go and do it, and you don't stop. Impossible isn't a problem. Inability isn't an issue. For example, I, I think Jesus is saying, uh, when it comes to this church, that he's going to be starting to want us to launch more video locations, more, more locations of the church, like Paisley, like Royston. And he's going to be raising up people who may not feel like they have what it takes, they'll have different skill sets, but, but they, have what it, they have really what it takes. They, they may not have what they think what it takes, but they have a willing spirit to say yes to Jesus and to keep saying yes to Jesus. And they have a leading in their spirit. And I think people are going to start talking to me more and more about this. Hey, you know, I, I wonder about maybe starting a, a, a location. And, and they're going to start emailing me. Maybe, maybe some of you will start emailing me. And people in our church, maybe people watching online, maybe people who hear about this third hand will start reaching out to me. And what I'm going to ask them when they reach out to me is, do you think this is Jesus? And then where is your where? Who is your who? And when is your when? Just some simple questions. And, and then if we talk and, and talk some specifics and we feel like this is a Jesus thing, then, then we'll say yes and make a simple strategy and, and go for it. Behind the scenes, uh, we're building some manuals and structures about this because when God started talking to me about this idea a couple weeks ago, a couple weeks ago, uh, 
I realized, like, oh, first of all, my response to Jesus was yes, and then my second response to Jesus was yikes. <laughs> Probably a normal response pattern. Yes, yikes. And if this is what you want us to do, Jesus, then I'm going to have to make some shifts, and we're going to have to make some, make some changes and, and build some new things, some new business strategies and all this to, to make it work out. But Jesus, Jesus says, says, yikes. Now, I, I think that God's going to be saying to some of you and, and some of you who hear this in the future, uh, maybe some of you who have thought to yourself, man, it would sure be great if Rehope would put a location here. I mean, maybe in Scotland, maybe in England, maybe in China, maybe in Africa. I, I, I don't know. Maybe God's saying to you that it's something he wants you to do, and you're like, yikes, yes. Yeah, that's, at least that's the right response. By the way, we are in the process of talking with three different people about three different locations currently. Now, this is just one example, but, but friends, whatever you might feel Jesus is wanting you to do, no one is ready. No one's ready. I wasn't ready. Even after seven years of training and five years of working in, in large churches, I came over here and I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready to, to start this church. And, and all Jesus had to keep teaching me is, Brian, all, all you need to do is keep saying yes, keep listening, keep trusting, and don't be afraid and don't be discouraged. Now, back to Mark here. If Jesus can send this formerly demonized guy who was once called Legion, the most untrained the most unready, the most newly set free from thousands of demons into ministry within hours, what can he do through you? And whatever your excuses might be, just keep remembering, it's not about if you can do this thing that Jesus has asked you to do. My key verse, one of the key verses of my life is from Zechariah chapter 4, that it's not going to be about my might or my power or my strategic thinking or my, or my, my, my anything but it's going to be by the Holy Spirit that anything of significance is ever going to happen. The challenge for today, has Jesus been speaking to you about something? Maybe recently. And it could be anything. But is Jesus speaking? The answer is yes. Even if it's yikes yes, it's still yes. And then again, if Jesus ever puts in your heart starting a Rehope video location, be brave. Email me about it. It's probably your next confirmation step. I want to lead us in a, in a prayer time. And this is not going to be one of those uh, responsive ones, but it is one where I'm going to put a few ideas out there and I want you to wrestle with God about them. And, and in the first one, I, I just want you to, in the quietness of here, just reaffirm between you and Jesus, Jesus, you are my king, I follow you. And, and I just say yes. Blank check. And then... A moment of, G Jesus, what does my king ask of me? Is there anything you want me to do or change or shift or start? Pivot, adjust, prioritize, deprioritize. And then again, affirm again, Jesus, I say yes. I say yes. Jesus, you are our king. We follow you. We thank you that you lead us, that you guide us. We, we cherish that you are, are living and that you are leading. Fill us with courage with boldness, with brave hearts, with hearts that will say yes and yes and never give up as long as you're, you're leading us forward. In the same time, prove, prove that you are 
uh, leading us by intervening in every crisis and every situation in all of our, our lives as we follow you. We love you and we look to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.